Welcome to this video. This video is the first part of a series, which help you step by step to write your own first plastic unit subroutine. In this video basics of Mises plasticity are explained. In the next video the algorithm which is used to solve Mises equations is depicted, and in the last video related unit subroutine is described. In this video at first plastic deformation in one-dimensional stress, is described by stress strain curve. Next plastic hardening is explained. After that Mises effective stress and effective plastic strain are defined. Then, Mises yield criterion and its characteristics is discussed. Finally, normality hypothesis and consistency condition which are two important parts of the plasticity are described. If you are interested to watch an introduction to the basics of Mises plasticity please keep watching. When we apply one-dimensional tension to a metallic sample, at first we observe a straight line in the stress-strain curve. In this line which is known as elastic region, deformation is recoverable. In other words, by removing the applied load, material return to its initial state and strain becomes zero. The slope of this line shows young modulus of the material. After this region material starts to deform plastically. The onset of the plastic deformation is known as the initial yield stress. In the plastic region, unloading path occurs with the same slope with elastic region, but in this case a part of the strain is recovered and a part is permanent. The permanent part of the strain is known as plastic strain and the recovered part is known as elastic strain. The total strain in the material is summation of these two strains. Considering unloading slope which was E, we can write the elastic strain based on stress and E. Writing the stress as a function of plastic and elastic strain is more useful, and this formula is used in plasticity numerously. After the yield point of the material the flow stress increases by increasing the plastic strain. This behavior of the material is known as strain hardening. In this region we can express the flow stress as a function of plastic strain. Usually simplified hardening behaviors are assumed for materials. For example, the simplest one is to assume that flow stress of the material is constant, this behavior is called perfectly plastic. In fact, in this case there is no hardening. It's also common to assume that, flow stress is a linear function of the plastic strain. This type of hardening is known as linear hardening. We discussed one-dimensional behavior of the material until now. In one-dimensional stress, we simply compare the applied stress with the yield stress to know the material is in plastic region or not. But in reality various kind of stress states may apply to a material. Any combination of normal stresses in three directions and shear stresses in three planes makes the stress tensor in a material point. How we can compare these stresses to the yield stress? In this case we need a concept which is known as effective stress. Effective stress is a scalar which is a representative of the stress tensor and can be used to show whether a material is in the plastic region or not. Similarly, various states of the plastic strains may be applied to a material. To express the plastic strain of the material, we should use a scalar parameter known as effective plastic strain. Please note that in plasticity we use rate or increment of plastic strains and solve the problem incrementally. To define Mises effective stress, consider the most general form of the stress tensor. At first we should take into account that based on experiments, plasticity of metals does not depend on hydrostatic stress. The hydrostatic stress is defined as the summation of the three normal stresses, or trace of the stress matrix divided by three. The plastic behavior of metals depends on the deviatoric stress tensor which can be calculated as follows. Using deviatoric stress tensor the effective Mises stress is defined as This product on two tensors is called double contracted product and means that multiply two tensors component by component and sum the terms to give a scalar quantity. In other words, this product contains summation of nine terms. It is interesting to investigate the formula for calculation of the second invariant of the deviatoric stress tensor. This formula is also similar to the Mises effective stress. We can write the relationship between effective stress and J2 as follows. 
For this reason, sometimes instead of the Miss S plasticity we call this criterion J2 plasticity. Now let's calculate the effective stress based on the stress components. At first we multiply each term of the divisoric stress by itself. Please note that for shear stresses the stress tensor components and divisoric stress components are identical. Please also notice that shear stress is repeated two times in the stress tensor. For the normal stresses we need to replace divisoric stresses by the stress components. For example, we replace the first one as follows. Replacing the second and third ones in the same way, and after some manipulation we obtain this formula. This is a general formula for effective stress, and can be simplified for various conditions. For the first example we write the effective stress based on the principal stresses. In this case all the shear stresses are zero. Therefore, the formula is simplified as. Now let's investigate the common situation of the plain stress condition. In this case the third normal stress, and these two shear stresses are zero. So, the effective stress formula is like that. We can rewrite this formula as. If we use principal stresses in the plane stress condition the shear stress is zero. Why in definition of the effective stress this coefficient was used? Consider the one-dimensional stress condition. We already know that in this case the effective stress should be equal to the applied normal stress. To calculate the effective stress at first we depict the divisoric stress tensor. Which hydrostatic stress is one-third of the normal stress in the first direction or sigma 1 1. This term can also be written based on the sigma 1 1. Now we calculate the effective stress, and it can be seen only by the coefficient of 3 divided by 2 the effective stress is equal to sigma 1 1. Effective plastic strain rate is also defined in the similar way. Let's calculate the trace of the plastic strain rate matrix. The trace shows some of the normal strains in three directions. In fact, this value shows the volume change of the material. In plastic deformation the volume is constant, or material is incompressible. So, this value should be zero. It is interesting, that considering the incompressibility condition results that strain tensor and divisoric strain tensor are identical. Therefore, the effective strain rate is defined as which double contracted product is used one more time. Considering simple tension, the plastic strain rate is as follows. Please note that to calculate 2 2 and 3 3 components of this matrix the following facts were used. First, some of the three components in the diameter of this matrix should be zero. Second, as the material is isotropic, transfer strains in two directions are equal. We expected that the effective strain rate is equal to the applied strain rate to the first direction. We can see that using the coefficient of 2 divided by 3, these two values are equal. Miss S criterion is the most famous and the best yield function for the plasticity of metals. The Miss S yield function is defined as effective stress minus flow stress. If the value of this function is negative, material is an elastic region. If the value of this function is equal to zero, material is in plastic region and combination of elastic and plastic deformation occurs in the material. We discussed about the calculation of effective stress. Now we can realize why this value is so important. We also saw that in the hardening region of the stress strain curve, flow stress increases as a function of effective plastic strain. To demonstrate Miss S yield function in the principal stress environment, at first we draw the line with equal angles with all axis. Along this line the three principal stresses are equal. In fact, by moving along this line only hydrostatic stress changes. As plastic behavior of metals does not depend on hydrostatic stress, the shape of the yield criterion is constant along this line. The yield locus of the Miss S criterion is a cylinder with this line as its axis. If one looks at the Miss S yield locus parallel to this axis, he sees the yield locus as a circle. This view is known as divisoric plane and is used in plasticity books to explain details of yield functions. Three important characteristics of polycrystalline metals which are obvious from this view, are as follows, first, material does not depend on hydrostatic pressure. 
second, material is assumed to be isotropic. You can see from this figure, changing the axis do not change the yield function. Third, the behavior of the material is the same in tension and compression. Now imagine that we want to use Mrs. criterion in plain stress conditions. For example, if sigma 1 1 is 0, we should use the intersection of the cylinder by the plane 2 3. Intersection of the cylinder by this plane is an ellipse. Please note that the yield stress in both direction is equal. The yield stress in compression is also the same as tension. We have now looked at the conditions necessary to initiate yielding. What happens after that if loading continues? Imagine that current stress state of the material locates on the yield surface. So, the yield function is zero. If we continue loading, the normality hypothesis of plasticity determines the direction of flow. Based on this hypothesis the direction of the plastic strain is normal to the yield surface. Plastic strain increment is in the normal direction n and d lambda shows its magnitude. The normal direction is the derivatives of yield function with respect to stress components. The second term of the yield criterion is not a function of stress. So, we should calculate the first term derivatives as follows. To calculate the derivatives of this term with respect to stress, we can calculate its derivative with respect to divitoric stress. Based on the definition of double contraction product we can write. Therefore, n is a multiplication of the divitoric stress. In other words, plastic strain increment is in the direction of the divitoric stress. Now the normal direction n is known. It's time to find the scalar coefficient d lambda. We start by effective plastic strain increment formula. Then replace the plastic strain increment by this relationship. By a simple manipulation we find that effective plastic strain increment is equal to d lambda. Now the plastic strain increment can be written as. The last task is to calculate the value of dp. This value can be found by consistency condition. In plastic deformation the yield function is zero. So its variation is also zero. We express variation of the yield function based on increments of stress and effective plastic strain. Now we replace derivatives of the yield function with respect to stress by n which shows plastic strain direction. Stress increment can be calculated by multiplying elastic stiffness tensor by elastic strain increment. Then replace elastic strain increment by total strain increment minus plastic strain increment. Substituting d sigma and consistency equation we obtain. And solving this equation gives us the value of dp. If we use isotropic linear hardening, we can replace derivative of yield function with respect to effective plastic strain by hardening slope. I hope you have enjoyed this video. Please watch our next videos about algorithm of solving these equations in UMIT subroutine for Ms. S. Plasticity. If this video was helpful, please let us know by a like or a comment. Do not forget to subscribe our channel and use more videos about mechanics and simulations.